Well, we've got uh, we've got a lot of folks here, and there's uh, an overflow room next door. Should uh, any of you feel the need for a little more air? Uh, welcome to the Keenan Distinguished Lecture in Ethics. I'm Noah Pickus, the director of the Keenan Institute for Ethics, and I want to thank, uh, as always, for support the Keenan family and the Keenan Fund for Ethics, and also the co-sponsors of uh, Paul Ekman's visit here: the Office of the President the uh, Philosophy Department, the Triangle Center on Terrorism and Homeland Security, the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience, and a big shout out to the Duke Institute for Brain Sciences, our fellow uh, institute here. I think as you can tell from that list of co-sponsors um, that we're at a special time in this, uh, in this uh, world, in this country, and especially here at Duke, where the study of ethics and the study of morality uh, is both the province of philosophers and theologians and also of social scientists and of scientists. That we have the convergence of empirical studies of morality with traditional philosophical and theological reflections. And you see that in the co-sponsors and in the interest that Paul's visit has attracted. We were at the law school today with Jim Coleman's uh, Innocence Project class where you had faculty and uh, law students interested in his work, as you might imagine, on lying. Um, tomorrow there will be a seminar uh, on emotion and compassion with faculty and graduate students. Uh, and the level of interest from all corners of the university has been just delightful. And of course it's one of the ironies that you have to uh, come all the way to Duke, I'm originally a Californian, and that you have to come all the way here to discover that all of these different disciplines are converging on the study of morality and ethics in new and incredibly exciting kinds of ways, and then you discover that in fact it was already there right at home. I grew up just a few blocks from Paul Ekman and Mary Ann Mason, uh, and his Paul and my father used to take early morning walks. And uh, the story we were uh, reminiscing about earlier this afternoon, I'm not sure how much I want to reminisce about it, but I'll tell you this part. When Paul was doing his book on, uh, is it Lying in Children? Yeah. Lying in Children, and I was, I don't know, 10 or 12, he decided to come interview me. <laughs> and maybe, A may truthful man. <laughs> so may maybe that's um, how I ended up getting involved in an ethics institute. I don't know. I've always been a little nervous about reading the, uh, reading the footnotes to that, uh, to that book. Um, one more, uh, one more introdu introductory comment of welcome, and that is actually to turn the podium over to Phil Costanza, who will formally introduce Paul. Um, I want to take a moment to say something about Phil because Paul being here and all of the work on uh, morality and ethics and psychology and neuroscience and sociology coming together um, is not by accident. There are a lot of people involved in this in a lot of departments and disciplines. But Phil is a psychologist who has been associated with the Keenan Institute for Ethics since, I don't know, the year dot it seems, at least since I can remember, and a senior fellow now and was chair of our faculty council. And I think it's fair to say sometimes was a, a lone psychology voice. Um, but because of Phil, uh, and because of his willingness to instruct us and engage us, uh, he has helped open up this world uh, of how psychology and neuroscience and the social sciences and sciences in general contribute to the study of morality and ethics. And I want to thank you, Phil, for that, because I know it hasn't always been easy. But we're here now, baby. We're here. Um, and I also wanted to make sure that you have the honor of introducing uh, Paul because you really know uh, his work in this world best. So, to you, Phil. Thank you, Noah. First of all, thank you, Noah, and welcome, everyone. Uh, one of the easiest jobs at these distinguished lectures, uh, whether they're the Keenan Distinguished Lectures or the University Distinguished Lectures, is you get to introduce people who need no introduction. And Paul Ekman is one of those people. Paul Ekman has penetrated our scholarly space, our popular press, uh, the world of science. Uh, he restored, was one of a group of individuals who actually, a lot of the 20th century, 
was spent trying to do psychology without the study of emotion. We didn't think we needed to early on. Uh, and, uh, and we didn't even think into the 60s that emotions had anything to do with our thinking. Uh, and uh, Paul was a sort of a lone scholar with a few others, like Sylvan Tompkins, who convinced us that not only emotion, that emotion was important to how we lived in the world, but emotion, in fact, might be very uh, carefully encoded in our very physiology. And uh, his hunches about that and his work with Sylvan to define the face and, and his own work in which he, he established a system for reading the face, for reading the cues in the face, for coding how we feel and whether we lie eventually and how we express compassion in a, in a more uh, uh, ethical sense and who we are as human beings is, is located within our emotional selves. And Paul's work has been extremely critical to that. I could describe his background. He has a PhD. Um, uh, he, he, in fact, uh, did his undergraduate work at the University of Chicago, who eventually, eventually they gave him an honorary degree. And he also went to NYU, uh, which is in a nice neighborhood. And, uh, and uh, uh, Paul also uh, received a PhD uh, in order to become a psychotherapist at Adelphi. Um, and he soon got diverted by science. Uh, he, he went from Freud to Darwin, and then from Darwin to the world of emotion. And uh, I, I really uh, need to also say that he has permeated the popular world. He currently tells us about lies on popular media. One of the very interesting things, and I'm going to turn to Paul's talk in a moment because you don't need to hear me talk, but one of the, one of the more interesting things about, about the work that Paul did beginning, I think, in the late 50s, or maybe it was even the early, but I think it was like 58 or something like that, uh, is that we had, no, we had no idea that we could map the emotional meaning of behavior in, in our very neurons. Uh, and we, we thought it was flighty, um, but it's actually located. Uh, and we can track its pathways, and we can understand it between species. Uh, now, Paul has stirred up some controversies over time. Are they universal emotions? He really tried to demonstrate that. Uh, but I think his work for the ethics, for, for the Keenan Institute, uh, for its relevance to the Keenan Institute, has to do with how we relate to one another as beings. Uh, do we speak honestly with one another? And if we don't, do we experience arousal? And does that arousal encode itself in how we act? And in our very twitches. And so I will twitch no longer. I'm speaking very honestly at this point, um, and uh, I think we can, well, I'll take my glasses off so we can read the eyes, which, <laughs> which are two-thirds of it, I'm told. And I uh, introduce Paul, who is going to, Paul Ekman, Professor Paul Ekman, who is going to uh, speak to us about when, why, and should we lie, and the science uh, behind the TV program, Lie to Me. He promised me not to talk about a lot of data. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much. Is this mic working? Yes. Uh, a lot of reasons for coming to do. Uh, I got, when I got my PhD, I got drafted into the Army. There still was a draft in those days. And I was the chief psychologist at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And my job was to uh, learn how to sort casualties during atomic warfare, which seemed we were about to engage in. And after two years of cutting the throats of poor goats, doing tracheotomies on goats, and recognizing how you can get somebody to get away from your aid station so you don't have to bury them if they've got too much radiation, I decided I should try to put a few years in on the other side of the ledger, seeing what I could do for work for peace. And that's how I met Noah's father. Noah was then five years old. Uh, his father remains one of my closest friends, a man I greatly admire for what he's tried to do, and some, often with some success, in introducing a different voice in the peace movement. Another reason for coming to Duke, which I completely forgot about, is Irv Alexander. Uh, 
Now, my mentor, the only person in academic psychology who didn't think I was out of my mind by studying facial expression, I mean, I had such people as the former president of the University of California, Richard Atkinson, uh, say to me, Paul, don't you realize there's nothing there? Why are you wasting your time studying faces? It's 1964. But Tompkins, and I, I believe Irv Alexander, who was here so, for so many years, took courses with Tompkins at Harvard. And so I met Irv Alexander a number of times, and it was Tompkins who was the one who said, no, it's going to be tough. You may not make it, but that's where the meat is. That's where there's a lot of information. And what's intrigued me about it also is the ethical questions that you keep getting, um, I'm trying to think of what's the right word, brushed by is not, you jar into ethical problems if you study deception. Now I should back up by saying the idea of studying deception was not mine. Uh, as it turns out, when I look back on what I've done in 40 or 50 years of research, none of the ideas that I ended up getting known for, none of the initial ideas were mine. Someone else suggested it. Uh, a group of young psychiatrists I was teaching in a medical school, not because I wanted to teach in a medical school, but they had the best salary scale in the city of San Francisco. <laughs> Uh, unlike Berkeley, they had an 11-month appointment, not nine-month, and 20% uh, higher salary. And they didn't think a psychologist knew anything, so they left you alone. So I had a, basically a research professorship. Uh, the young psychiatrist said to me, after I told them all the interesting things I was learning about the face and the body, listen, we've got a really tough problem. We, the least experienced people in the department, are the ones who are given the task of whether or not to let a patient who had come into the hospital because of a very serious suicidal attempt, whether to release them for a weekend pass when they say they're feeling better. And we know from past experience, most of them are. But occasionally, one of them kill, kills themselves within an hour of getting free of the hospital supervision. So how can we tell whether they're lying? We can't tell. Can you tell? Well, it took me 25 years, now we can tell. Didn't realize it's such a hard problem. But it's a fascinating problem, even on a basic research level. It raises the question of to what extent are we as human beings able to convincingly fabricate emotional behavior? Does it take a Lawrence Olivier, or can all of us do it? And to what extent can we conceal how we're really feeling from others? Or will it leak out in some fashion? These are questions I'll get to in a moment. Well, once I began studying the lies of suicidal patients, this is 1962, I found that there were lies everywhere, not just in suicidal patients. Uh, I'll show you if this works. I think it's going to work. This is the first test of technology, of Duke technology. <laughs> you heard that? I didn't hear that wasn't for, I'm going to try a different one. So this is a, I think this is a two weeks old uh, magazine at the Safeway supermarket. Liar, liar, inside their web of deceit. Ben never stopped chasing other women. Courtney faked her tearful apology. Now there's another girl. Why, it's over already. Okay? Well, clearly, they don't put this on the cover unless they're going to sell magazines. But take a look at the opposite end of the spectrum. This is the same week. This is an op-ed by Thomas Friedman in the New York Times, A Festival of Lies. <coughs> so it, it's across the spectrum is the concern with lying. The, my focus has been on high-stake lies. 
lies where you could lose your life if you're caught, or your freedom, or your job, or an important relationship, or your reputation. Lies which, if you're caught, you lose trust, and it may never be regained. So I'm going to first take up the questions in the title, which I didn't make up. But they were given to me. And then I'm going to talk about the up and down side, because this is really an issue, an ethical issue. When the TV people come knocking, knocking, knocking on your door and say, we want to do a TV series, a dramatic TV series based on you, and we're going to pay you money, and you're going to get well known, and all that. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Does that advance the values you're interested in or harm them? So when and why do we lie? It turns out there are a number of different motives that produce lying. This is the most common one, shouldn't be any surprise to any of you. It's so for children and for adults. You know, when the traffic cop pulls you over and says, did you realize you were going 70 miles an hour in a 40 mile an hour zone? <laughs> Even if you're a policeman, a policeman who've been pulled over by other policemen tell me, they begin to shake. And they, of course, lie. Oh, I'm sorry, officer, I didn't realize it's going that fast. Well, in my study that Noah referred to of children's lies, one of the questions I asked a child, I don't remember what I asked you. Suppose you are sitting in your car next to your dad, and he's going 70 miles an hour, and you say to him, Dad, it says 40 miles an hour. And he says, oh, we're late, we've got to go fast. And then you hear the siren of the police car and it pulls your dad over. And the officer says, sir, how fast were you going? And your dad says, well, I thought I was only going 45 miles an hour. And then my question to the kid is, what would you say? And the 10-year-old said, dad, you're a liar. <laughs> Because children at that age are zealots for the truth. Okay? The 13-year-olds won't. Okay? But the 10-year-olds will turn their own father in. <laughs> we usually underestimate the severity of the punishment that might occur. And we usually, you know, punishments can occur for a deliberate misdeed, like breaking the speeding laws. Or an accidental one. I mean, you can knock. I remember my tragic misdeed of breaking this beautiful hand cut crystal vase in my parents' living room. Of course, the first misdeed is I was never supposed to be in their living room. <laughs> the second one was I broke the crystal. So I didn't want to get punished. Who broke the crystal? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Of course, I do know, but I don't want to get punished. So for children and adults, it's the most common reason to avoid punishment. <coughs> oh, this is an interesting one, and that's to get something easier than you could get it if you had to work for it. So some of the data show, in this statement, without numbers, that uh, people who have high IQs are not likely to cheat on academic tests. They are likely to cheat on tests of athletic ability. <laughs> Good athletes are not likely to cheat on tests of athletic ability, but on tests of academic performance. <laughs> now, this is one I hope we'll come back to afterwards. <laughs> because I'm reading a book, a fascinating book, called Enemies. The History of the FBI, just published two weeks ago. And uh, 
It's all about the illegal things the FBI did for decades. I mean, you name your favorite president, and he authorized breaking the law. There isn't one who didn't. Carter is the only exception. The rest of them, from Ronald Reagan to JFK, all authorized breaking the law deliberately again and again uh, in going after, and the rationale was terrorists. But it wasn't terrorists. They were put domestic political opponents, by and large. Um, but in the work I do with Scotland Yard uh, and with NYPD counterterror, it is clear that the reason we have not had another major 9-11 is because of undercover work. In undercover work, a policeman lies and pretends that he's on the other side in order to find out what they're up to. And that has prevented many disasters. But they're doing it by lying. And now I'm being asked to help train them to be better liars so they don't get caught. I always used to like to say I run a school for lie catchers, not a school for liars. I was asked by one sitting president, who will go unnamed, and by two governors to coach them in enhancing their credibility. <laughs> Well, if that's wrong, is it wrong to teach a policeman how to be a really good liar and get away with it? For a greater good? Will he always use it for the greater good? We'll come back to these things if you want to. <coughs> to protect another person. You see this a lot in adolescence. Uh, you know, you're not going to rat on your teacher says, OK, who broke the record player? Who broke the iPod would be more likely. <laughs> who broke the iPod while I was out of the room? And it's your best friend who broke the iPod. You're going to say, my best friend? No. So you're doing it for an altruistic reason. Oh, this is another one. This is a really interesting one. This is one of the ones that allows me to catch people. It's just the thrill of getting away with it. You tell the lie because it's so exciting to see whether I can pull it off. John Walker, Navy, sold to the Soviet Union the secrets for how we kept propellers on our nuclear submarine silent. Before the Soviets knew that, we knew where all of their subs were with their nuclear weapons. They didn't know where ours were, so we had an enormous advantage. So how did we catch Walker? Was it through careful investigation? No. Was it through the polygraph? No. Walker couldn't resist telling his wife, bragging, <coughs> about all the money he was getting in the Soviet Union. And he was divorced and behind in alimony. <laughs> she turned him in. The first three times she turned him in, she was drunk, and so the FBI wouldn't talk to her. The FBI are very straight kinds of people. You don't give them information which is vital to national security if you're drunk. You have to be sober. <laughs> Now, this is one quick fix to get out of an order, awkward situation. Uh, are you free for dinner tonight? Uh, um, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm busy. No. Well, how about next weekend? Oh, I might, we're going out of town next weekend. The weekend after that? So it's just a, you know, there are other ways to deal with these problems. And nobody teaches you how to be truthful without hurting people's feelings. There isn't a little book you can read on that, and parents seem to ignore it. I'll get through this list. To win the admiration of others. Now, this is the bragger. My dad has two Cadillacs. He's three Cadillacs, better than Mitt Romney. He's got 
Now, the name dropper, and these aren't just children. <coughs> they're doing it for the same reason. They want you to like them. To like them, they'll lie for you to like them. To maintain privacy, this you get mostly from an intrusive parent. Where were you last night? Oh, I was out. See anybody? No, no, just had a nice walk. <laughs> One of the hardest things as a parent is that as your kids get older and get to the age where they could really get into trouble, you have to give them autonomy. You have to give them privacy. It starts out they don't have any privacy. You know everything. You're their grand protector. But then, in order for them to grow, the Dalai Lama asked me once, what can there be malevolent compassion? And my answer was that the overprotective parent, that's malevolent compassion. Because you don't allow your child to grow without privacy. Is there another one here? Yes. <coughs> to control others. Some people like to control, and if you can control the information people have, then you've got a lot. Incidentally, virtually everything I am saying is in a book that Amazon sells for only $9, and I only get 40 cents royalty, so I don't feel badly. You don't have to write it down if you don't want to. It's called Telling Lies. Now, the decision to lie is made when the decision is made to engage in a misdeed. It isn't that I decide, forgive me, I decide I'm going to cheat on my wife, and then afterwards I think, oh, well, I cheated on my wife, I better lie about it. No. When I make the decision I'm going to cheat on my wife, I've made the decision. If I'm going to cheat on an embezzled money, I've made the decision I'm going to lie about it. I don't say, hey, I, I embezzled $100,000 today. Is that okay? <laughs> no. So those are not made independently of each other. And our research has shown that almost all liars overestimate how easy it will be to maintain a lie over time and underestimate the costs. So beware of that tendency. It's harder than you think to maintain a lie over time and it's, the costs are usually greater than you think they're going to be. Now, not everybody lies when they're tempted. And here's what we have found about those who are least likely to lie. That is, when you offer an op opportunity. One, religiously observant people are much less likely to lie. All organized religions, and if you take your organized religion seriously, which some do, are much less likely to lie. The second is, you don't like taking risks. There are people who like taking risks, and there are people for whom risks are very aversive. And if risks are very aversive, you're not going to lie. And the third is, you know from past experience that you get caught. You're a lousy liar. So that's not a very noble reason, but it is a reason. The characteristic we most want in a mate in a friend or in a leader is truthfulness. That's so on every public opinion that's been done where the question has been asked, and that's in the last 40 years, never changes. I mean, just think. When I was working with kids, I would say, how can you play shoots and ladders if somebody is cheating? It doesn't work, you can't play the game. You can't live intimately with a work associate with a friend, uh, with a lover, if they're cheating on you, or you suspect they're cheating on you, or you've caught them cheating on you. Now, Jefferson pointed out that we need an informed citizenry, but we face the dilemma that when we speak to our citizen, citizenry, we speak to the enemy. And over time, the deception of the enemy 
deceives our own citizenry and deprives them of the ability to make the kinds of judgments that are necessary in a democracy. He did not come up with a solution for that. Did anyone ever condemn Eisenhower for the elaborate lengths that he went to to try to convince the Nazis that we were going to open a second front in Calais rather than Normandy? Was Carter condemned for his attempt to rescue the hostages? No, he was condemned because it failed. At the very moment the hostage uh, Helicopters were in the air. Jody Powell, his public relations person, said, we have no intention of rescuing Hunt. So you can lie in warfare. Well, that gets us involved in the situation. I'll only raise the question. I won't answer it. Is, there, is it correct to characterize our dealings with terrorism as a war. Because if you do, then you're justifying all the kinds of things we've done <coughs> in wars before. Now there's another occasion when the truth should not be told. In fact, there are a series of occasions that I want to go over with you. Now, perhaps the most obvious one is when it's going to be cruel. Um, Does that dress look good on me, honey? No, actually, it's the wrong color. It's for a woman much younger than you, and you're a little too overweight to wear it. <laughs> Might be true, but it sounds a little cruel. I ran into this with my best friend. And he said to me, after having had four really failed long-term relationships, he said, Paul, you've got to meet my new girlfriend. She's different than all the rest. I finally have found the right person. OK, so I met her. She was the worst I'd ever seen. <laughs> what do you think? I've got to know. You're my best friend. Well, I tried the politician's dodge. I can tell that you're really in love with her. <laughs> And answer the question. Now I really want you to know. I want you to tell me what you think. So I told them. This is going to be a disaster. And it's just a matter of time. It's going to take you one year or five years. This is a really bad relationship. And you, well, of course, I didn't see him until the end of the relationship. <laughs> Is this your obligation? I'm not telling you what your obligation is. Is it your obligation to speak truth to a friend who asks you for the truth? I myself believe it is not your obligation to volunteer the truth unless the truth is in danger, unless by doing that you're endangering someone's life. But if someone you have an established and intimate relationship with you, asks you for the truth, and you can be certain, even if you know they're not going to want to hear the answer, my own judgment is you're telling them. Now, there was just an article in the New York Times in this last week about do we tell the dying patient that they're dying? And is there a general rule to tell them? Well, you're taught, you know, your days are, are limited. We've run out of things we can do. There might be hope. But medically, there is no hope. Miracles happen, but that's not medicine. Who makes that decision? Does the patient make that decision? Do they have enough foresight to make it before they get ill? Does their spouse or children make it for them? You must all remember this case in Florida where they kept somebody alive and the husband really had to go to the high court to finally be allowed to pull the plug on someone who it was believed was not any longer 
living as we think of what living entails. I'm not giving you an answer. I'm only telling you that it isn't, these aren't easy issues. That's why they're interesting to ethicists, because they're not easy issues. Those of you who may remember St. Thomas Aquinas will remember his example of you're sitting in your house and your brother is asleep in the room next door and a man runs in with a knife. This is pre-gun. He runs in with a knife and he says, where is your brother? I'm going to kill him. Now, St. Thomas thought we should never, lying is a sin. So how do you, by telling him where to, kill, where to kill your brother, you can't do that either. So how do you handle this situation? I'm not going to give you the answer. You have to go back and read St. Thomas. He did not have a satisfactory answer. <coughs> now, I define a lie differently than how most people, a small handful, you know there's only less than a dozen people in the world who are studying lies. They're everywhere except in academia. <laughs> Not that academics don't lie to each other, but they don't think it's worth looking at. There's an unwritten rule in academic psychology. I won't throw rocks at other fields, but I certainly will since I was a psychologist for 50 years. The unwritten rule is, if it's useful, it's not important. And most of the research on deception is very useful. It's useful in the courts, it's useful for the police. Uh, it's useful in how you bring up your kids and what you teach them about what you expect of them and what are the costs involved if they get in a reputation of lying. Children, here's a fact. Here's a factoid. Children who between the ages of 8 and 14 are known by their friends and their teachers as lying have 10 times the arrest record after 21. It's a danger signal. Now, most of them don't have an arrest record, but it's a much higher rate for those who do. So my definition of lying is a fairly simple one. It has two criteria. First, it's a deliberate decision to mislead the target. You have to know what you're doing at the time you do it. If I give you the wrong directions for getting to the library, I gave you false information, but that's not a lie. It's the intent to mislead. Psychologists used to not like to think that intent was part of our problems. Second criteria, there's no prior notification. What do I mean by that? Well, you can't lie in poker. You can't win in poker unless you bluff, but everybody knows that everyone else is going to bluff. So you don't expect anybody to tell you the truth. Henry Kissinger says that in diplomacy, nobody expects you to set the bottom line. You are allowed to conceal, but you must never falsify. Those are two different techniques. Falsification, and you're through. Nobody will talk to you again as a diplomat, according to Kissinger. But concealment, that's what everybody expects. And of course, there's a real motive, and I see what's being concealed. Can I get beneath the mask? Have you ever had the experience of selling your house for $50,000 less than you asked for? And the person said to you, you lie. You sold it for less than you were asking. We all know that the asking price is not the selling price, so you're notified, right? And certainly, uh, the people that we got to know in the Soviet Union, this was astounding to that the asking price was not that you publicly lied, you advertised an untruth. Different rule. So what about in employment? Are you obligated to tell your associate director when you're thinking about the fact that you might have to replace that associate director? And if so, how much advance notice are you obligated to give them? 
Are they obligated to tell you when they decided they're going to look for a better job? My little bit of dealings in the business world since I opened up a startup is this is very muddy water. There's very little prior notification of what you can expect. And last but not least, what about in marriage? What she doesn't know won't hurt her. I know my wife, she'd rather not know. I know my wife, she would rather not know. The, I had a friend, a very, I mentioned this person's name, one of the most famous psychologists in the country today. And she said to me when making a pass, as long as I'm out of town, anything goes. I said, did you ask your husband whether he agrees to that? Oh, I know he does. So you have to watch out for what you assume. But it's easier to make the notifications explicit. You can avoid a lot of trouble if you do that. Now, our research has identified behavioral clues to deceit that are the result of cognitive and emotional overload. If a liar is under suspicion, the stakes are high, and the questioning is good. Those are a lot of requirements. We've developed online training tools to spot concealed emotions and how to use that information most constructively. But the problem is that some of the people who are using our tools are using it to be better torturers. That wasn't my goal. My goal was that I'd be better counselors, better parents, and be able to better read the emotional state of the other person. But you can't control how people use your information. It is used by countries whose policies I think are as deplorable on human rights as the world has ever known. They are some of the biggest consumers of my products, which I thought was making communication more easy and understandable. We do follow the practice that I never comment on anyone who's in litigation, or anyone who's running for office, or is in office. It's been a terrible loss. <laughs> Particularly in the last six months, there's been so much entertainment I couldn't have talked about. <laughs> the work I've done has gotten a lot of uh, publicity. I've been on the Johnny Carson show, on Oprah, on the Jim Lehrer show. Time magazine named me one of the not, one of the hundred most important people in the year 2009. What a grandiose assertion. <laughs> that they would know who those people were. Um, but what caused me the most trouble and the most opportunity is what you're seeing here. This is an article by Malcolm Gladwell in 2002 on the Naked Face in the New Yorker. Produced over 3,000 emails of a, non, of a serious nature. And it was read by Brian Grazier. Now, Brian Grazier is the biggest producer of film and TV. Titanic, which everyone is talking about, that's his film. Uh, Apollo 13 is his film. Da Vinci Code is his film. J. Edgar Code. Hoover is his film. 24 is his series. So Brian, after he read the article in The New Yorker, uh, said, i got to do a TV series about this. It's, I just have to find the right writer, and we'll have the series. The series ended up being called Lie to Me. And the writer, Sam Baum, who was the executive producer the first year and the head of the production studio owned by Grazier, came up to see me. And they basically said, we're going to do this with you or without you. There's so much stuff about you on the internet and on YouTube. You've published books about lying. We don't need you. 
But if you sign the contract, one, we'll pay you. <laughs> Two, you'll get to review every contract and tell us where we're off base. We may not listen to you, but at least you'll have been able to tell us when we're wrong. And you'll be able to rule certain things out. So I ruled out, I've been working with the Dalai Lama for the last 10 years, and I said, you can't have anything about him. It's fine. Probably didn't think that would sell. The, uh, so I'm now going to show you the first four minutes of the first program. What am I doing? It's very dense with information. There are 12 distinct messages in that four minutes. There are two major points that are both correct. Here's the first one. Microexpressions exist. Most people didn't know they existed before those very fast signs of concealed emotion. And facial expressions of emotion are universal. Incidentally, Darwin said this was proof of the unity of all humankind that we were all descended from a single progenitor. Uh, every now and then, you know, I just got an article to respond to. Somebody tries to come up with some evidence that there are uh, non-universals, but nothing has so far survived that. So there's our major messages. Two of both are correct. Here's the minor. And six are corrected. And there's scientific disagreement about two, and two of them are wrong. Now, I went over this. I told them about the two that are wrong. They said, oh, but they're so good. <laughs> they're so entertaining. So here's the minor points. Watching reactions to questions is informative. That is, is one of the things I teach policemen is it doesn't matter whether the person responds verbally. You ask them the important questions and then watch their facial response. The shrug fragment is very informative, and he showed you that. Uh, if it contradicts the words that are being spoken, and it's not a full shrug, but only a fragment, we have so far in seven years never lost on it as a sign of lying. Long surprises are false. Surprise is the shortest of all emotions. Last, less than a second till you figured out what it was that you didn't, you didn't expect to be happening. And then you either are bored or you feel good or you're afraid or you're angry. But it's, Carl Heider called it a way station, not an endpoint emotion. Uh, the depiction of scorn is pretty good. Depiction of contempt is pretty good. And this is John Gottman's work. When your spouse shows disgust, that pretty much pr predicts that the marriage is over. Uh, here's what scientists disagree about. Uh, whether we can know how often people tell lies. That's often been uh, assayed by having people fill out questionnaires about how often they lie. Well, what makes you think a liar will be truthful about how often they lie? <laughs> or what makes you think that they remember how often they lie? The only way, we need an invisible cloak. And whenever one is available, I'll walk around and check on how often people lie. Until then, we don't know. And there's a lot of debate, and I'll I bet 20 to 1 that there is no distinctive expression for shame that's different than sadness or anguish. One of my former postdocs, very nice guy, Dr. Keltner, disagrees. Here's where they're wrong. The appearance of the happy expression was a really bad version. They tried to do a happy micro, and they just didn't get it right. And uh, they confused the startle. Remember when he threw that thing? That produced a startle. A startle is totally different than surprise. It's a reflex. It's a very old reflex. So, you know, for popular television, not too bad. <laughs> Nothing terribly harmful. 
But there is something fundamentally harmful about this program, which ran for three years. Incidentally, after the third program, I started going down to Hollywood and coaching the actors on how to try to do it more correctly. <laughs> and the first year actors liked that. So they fired them all. They also fired the executive producer. It was too big a hit. They also fired all the writers. This is an old Hollywood story I learned. If you got a big success on your hands, one of the things you might well do is just fire everybody and try again. So the second year, the ratings were half of the first year. Third year, the ratings went down even further. Tim Roth, who played Dr. Lightman, said, this is a program about Dr. Lightman, not Dr. Ekman. I don't want to do science. It's about my character. So it went off the air. But before it went off the air, it created, one, some false information about the signs that, of when people were lying. And more importantly, it created the impression that it's easy to tell whether someone's lying. That you could learn, if you watch this program, you're going to be just as good as Dr. Lightman. And someday you're going to sit on a jury and you're going to convict somebody of a crime they didn't commit because you think you can do it. And so I got them to let me write a blog on Fox's very own website called The Truth About Lie to Me, Separating the Science from the Fiction, and which I would point out every mistake they made. <laughs> However, only a third of the people who watched the program read my blog. My blog always opened with, I never solved a problem as quickly as Dr. Lightman, or with as much certainty, but I always had more than 45 minutes to do the problem. So, well, this is the overall 66%. So the erroneous clues to deceit, and more importantly, that catching liars is easier and more certain than it is, has been perpetrated on the American public. And uh, I'm part of that perpetration, and there wasn't anything I could do uh, to get out of it. Um, this is my book, Telling Lies, that I mentioned earlier. This is a book that I wrote recently in which I took everything that I had learned in basic research that I thought could be used to improve emotional life, and I put it into layman's language. And this is my most recent book, which is a book of dialogue with the Dalai Lama. And I think I will stop and take questions. Thank you. Yes, all the way in the back. You mentioned that religious people are less likely to tell lies or they tell them frequently. Yes. phrase self-deception. It's a non-starter for me. And um, I think we have perfectly adequate terms. We have repression, we have rationalization, we have suppression to describe, we have dissociation to describe quite different psychological processes whereby we don't know what it is we're doing or thinking. And self-deception implies that we can deliberately choose to mislead ourselves. Uh, I'm not sure that ever occurs. In the uh, book, Telling Lies, I have about a 10-page detailed analysis of the episode in which one of our uh, spaceships blew up. Can't remember the name of it. Challenger. And uh, my friend Danny Goldman said it was because the engineer had deceived himself. I think that was just totally mistaken. The engineer knew just what he was doing. And he, he made a bad decision. He knew that Congress was very impatient and didn't want any more delays. He had seen the scientific report that given these weather conditions, there was a chance that the 
rubber O-rings would not hold, and he decided to take the risk. Bad choice, he lost. No self-deception, he knew what he was doing. So I think we have to be very careful about self-deception. And the, all of us only know some of who and what we are. Um, others know different things about us than we often know about ourselves. But I have no reason to believe a priori that that's more so of any one philosophical or religious group than another. Yes, ma'am. Is uh, Botox ethical? Is what? Is Botox ethical? Paralyzing this um, California is a really strange place. <laughs> In California, you cannot ask somebody, how, do they have Botox? You cannot even ask them, are you on any medications? Not a lot to ask. Really terrible. I mean, I would certainly want to know what kind of medications you're on. I was going to have to try to question you on a witness stand. Uh, it's very obvious when people are using Botox, because the face doesn't move. I, have a little bit of research, a little bit of research to suggest that we are more drawn to animated faces. So Botox may make you look younger, but less appealing. <laughs> the biggest use of Botox in American medicine today is for migraine headaches that can't be helped. And it's a very interesting phenomenon, because you're going You've always thought of the contraction of the corrugator and the procerus muscles as external symptoms of the headache. But if you can prevent those muscles from moving, you can relieve the headache. And that fits with research that Bob Levinson and I did years ago, which showed that you can voluntarily, if you can get the right muscle movements on your face, you can turn on any emotion. The arrows go both ways. The expression is not just simply a display system, but it is a stimulus system for turning on emotion. Not, yes, ma'am. Well, I was just wondering, so you know, does that mean people use Botox all the time? Uh, to <laughs> being emotional or having emotions or being a Well, it certainly should. Repeat the question. Uh, would using Botox decrease your emotional experience? Uh, I think that's highly likely. I don't, Botox people offered to fund some of my research, but I'm sure they wouldn't fund that one. <laughs> Paul, excuse me. So if you have a question, Rachel has the microphone here, and if you'll raise your hand, you can either come up to her there or she'll come over to you. Or you can form a line so we don't have delays. I missed it. <laughs> Well, I said earlier that I haven't run a school for liars, so I don't have the answer to that. Um, I do know, we've tested you now oh, about 1,000 people on their ability to perpetrate lies. And about 4 or 5% we can't catch. And uh, uh, in one of my books, I call them natural liars or natural performers. Um, the, we don't know much about them. Um, could people be taught? You know, I'm still struggling with the decision as to whether or not I'm willing to in any way participate in that. I've always thought that saving lives, it would save lives, yes, it's something I should be doing, particularly since the federal government supported me my whole career. But I'm not sure whether I want to cross that line into uh, teaching people how to be better liars than they already are. So in one of my favorite episodes of Lightman, uh, Lightman uh, confronts a person in a contest in front of a big room, and the person beats him, and Lightman says, he must be a psychopath, because he beat me and he could lie and I couldn't detect it. In 
in that episode, did you do any research about lying about psychopaths, or do you know anything about lying about psychopaths? Yeah, I do. And is it harder to do? No, it's one of the. It's, it's, it's another instance in which they wouldn't pay attention to what I told them. <laughs> Uh, John Hare is really our world expert on psychopathy. And uh, in one or two joint studies with John, we found that psychopaths were not better than anyone else as lying. They, we found just as many mistakes. But most lies succeed because we want to believe the lie. And we really want to believe psychopaths because they're so charming. So they start out with an enormous advantage uh, over everyone else. But they're no better. Uh, there is one big difference, and that is if you're lying to someone with whom you share some values, you may feel guilt. They won't. If you know that the consequences of your lie is going to be doing harm to your target, you may feel some ambivalence, they won't. It's only if it's going to do harm to them that you're going to see uh, the kind of overload in cognition and emotion that can produce these kinds of lies. There's a fair amount of interest in the intersection between cognitive neuroscience and lying. Uh, for example, there's the recent work that healthy people will lie more quickly and effectively if you can suppress the anterior cingulate. There are different groups, including companies that claim to have EEG or fMRI-based lie detection methods that are superior to conventional calligraphy. Do you have any, any comment on this? Is there any useful work in cognitive neuroscience associated with deception or deception detection? Well, I can't claim to know all that's being done. And I do know that some of it is proprietary, and so we don't know what's being done. And some of it is classified. But I do know what DARPA paid for, and it's just total nonsense. Um, because they did not compare lies with inventions, motivated inventions. Uh, well, I mean, so you're shooting fish in a bowl. The, I mean, you could, do you remember back in the days when if you got an airline magazine for $15, you could buy a device that you could hook up to your phone and tell whether someone was lying to you? They lasted for about four years. They don't work. <laughs> but it takes quite a while before the public finds out they don't work. Now, here, I think it's both investors uh, uh, and uh, I don't want to say anything nasty about the federal government, since they're the best parents I ever had. <laughs> and uh, they really treated me well uh, for a long, long, long time. But uh, program managers uh, at an agency like DARPA tend to be people who didn't make tenure in computer science. And they don't know much about the social psychology of deception. And so the experiments that they had examined. Now, there, you know, the problem is the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. I should say the left pinky doesn't know what the finger next to it is doing. Because there are parts of DARPA that supported some really excellent deception research, but none of that involved fMRI. Uh, will we get to the point where, by measuring fMRI, uh, we'll be able to tell whether someone is lying. Uh, I would be very surprised if that's on the horizon in the next 20 years. Uh, not that lying and telling the truth are the same. Uh, they're not. But I don't see a that we have the tools yet to deal with that level of complexity uh, that's involved in picking up deception from that. There was a the National Academy of Sciences report about four years ago that I was one of the co-authors on, on is the polygraph scientifically valid for national security? And the one sentence summary of the report is no evidence. Uh, 
the idea that you could actually use an fMRI in an airport, uh, maybe in an interrogation room, but the best way to use that is to scare people into thinking. Uh, there used to be something you used in polygraphy called the stim test, and you would uh, take your suspect and you'd say the machine makes no mistakes. I'm going to show you it makes no mistakes. So it's, I mean, if you confess, I'll try to get you a lighter sentence, but only if you confess now. Now, let me first show you why the machine's going to beat you. So pick any card you want, put it back in, and I'll shuffle the deck, and I'll tell you the card. Well, of course, it was a marked deck. So I always told you the right card, and lots of people confessed. I got enormously berated for having described that in public by the people who were giving the stim tests. Do you know what you're doing to American security by letting people know that that's a fake? Another question? Hi. Uh, so there's been, uh, you've shown quite convincingly that uh, there are these prototypical emotional expressions on the face, uh, up from, uh, and, and also related from Darwin's language as well, yes. coming up from animals. Um, now, in research that moves forward, uh, do you have any advice for um, uh, working through the context surrounding other facial expressions that cover more of human experience? Uh, for instance, on, on this side of uh, the East Coast side, there's some research into uh, facial expressions during learning, for instance, uh, and how that might indicate how well a student is learning and how their emotions are. Uh, the face is not dedicated just to emotion. It does all kinds of things. And it's involved in a lot of instrumental acts, and spitting and kissing, and, uh, symbolic gestures. Uh, um, I, the French one I like is it. The, uh, so we have already identified. There's an article. If you write me, I'll send it to you. It's about 40 years old on uh, identifying what I call the conversational signals of the face that manage the back and forth flow that indicate whether or not you know the answer to the question that you're asking, something that's very useful for adolescents to know in dealing with their parents. And uh, there's a, it's not as rich a system as the face, and we don't know whether it's a universal system. We've only studied it in English speakers. But clearly there is, I do not think we will find another universal facial expression of emotion. Uh, having looked at so many and never seeing anything new. But I do think there are many signs of different types of cognition that have yet to be described. In this one, we described about 10 or 15. So paulekman.com will get you to my email address. I can, I, can, I can talk a lot. I just wanted to ask you a question. You mentioned social psychology, and I'm thinking of that in relationship to both social psychology and social neuroscience. So one of the things we do know is that individuals can self-persuade, even if they begin with deceptive intent, uh, by repeating. Uh, and, and uh, habituate to their own um, uh, deception. Uh, and uh, is it then not any longer a deception uh, if, in fact, they come to believe their luck uh, because it is repeated? And just one further question about the neuroscience of it. Isn't neuroscience about the change in the pattern of response to a stimulus, the, the neural responses to a stimulus? So, as we become less prone to regard our behavior as a lie, uh, are we also showing different patterns? Uh, uh, Give that man a grant. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, these are empirical questions. I don't know the answer to them. My suspicion is that if you can, let's suppose uh, you accidentally fatally injured somebody and drove off, mm -hmm. and nobody saw him. Mm -hmm. So it's a severe 
event. Could you over time convince yourself that they ran into you? And actually, you were paused. And if you, would there be then no sign? I don't know. I just don't know. My theoretical position is that you have to know you're lying in order for us to catch you. We have to be dealing with that kind of an overload of the system uh, where your apprehension that I'm going to detect what it is that you know that you're doing, but you no longer know it. If you, here's an interesting thing that's only a side light on it. Um, one of my colleagues at Langley Porter showed me a clinical case in which there was very strong evidence that the patient was repressing enormous hostility and had no awareness of it. I saw microexpressions of anger. And I couldn't tell from the expression itself whether it was repressed or suppressed. So I wasn't joking when I said this would be an interesting study. It would be interesting to know the answer to it. And whether, you know, is that the way you should practice people who are going to do undercover work? Just, you know. Situation. Put, right. Maybe that would be the way to do it. Although I'm really reluctant to go along that line to try to think through what you should do. It's such a, undercover is such a problem. Because it's really, I already know from working the other side of the street, you train somebody to be a, let's say, a good TSA detector of dangers in tank, and six years later, they're going to be selling it to China. Because they'll get an offer. And there are other governments who want to use it, not for reasons that you're going to enjoy. So you're putting <coughs> knowledge in the hands of people who, who you totally disagree with. And on uh, lying, it gets so, so much worse. And you get the situation is so much noisier. I, I wrote somewhere about what would it be like just to imagine, I don't know where this is, it's in the end of the book, Why Kids Lie. What would it be like if we could all lie perfectly and we could never know how someone really felt? Is that a world you'd want to live in? What would it be like if none of us could lie at all? There was a movie about that. And, you know, that's terrible. I mean, it's too much in your face. So. Well, we are imperfect liars and imperfect lie detectors, and that's probably the best that we can be, and we have to watch out tinkering with the system too much to change it. Yes. What are the most interesting ways that lying and lie detection differs between men and women? I thought you were going to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> the, in our research, we have found no differences. We found enormous individual differences among men and among women that wipe out male-female differences. But we didn't choose situations that would be more likely to draw upon differential experience with particular dilemmas, like how many sexual partners have you had in the last month? Uh, we dealt with fairly, we dealt with crime, uh, political lies, uh, and, and, and lies about theft. And we really didn't, de and there we found no difference between males and females. Which isn't to say that they may not be there, they're just not there in the context that we examined. But again, I can't emphasize enough, there are these huge, huge individual differences between people in their uh, expressive behavior and in their ability to manage 
uh, very difficult laws. And the stakes are very high. I've got two questions for you. One, um, with the emotional expressions um, that appear to be universal, is there an age in which that begins to be seen? So how young a child can you expect to be able to see that? And the second question, which isn't exactly related to that, is here in Durham County, uh, the, the police department in Durham County uses what's called a voice stress test. And I'm wondering, is there any connection between what we're talking about here, which is facial expressions, and any, any change in voice patterns with uh, picking up on deception? Um. The chief protagonists about the age at which you can recognize six or seven emotions are Carol Izzard on one side and um, Linda Cameras and, and Harriet Oster on the other side. And I don't have a dog in that fight. Uh, the, it's an empirical question. Neither one of them have decisive data. Uh, it is clear that you do see, in the first day of life, you see enjoyment signs and pain signs. And it is also clear that the last emotion to unfold is contempt. Um, that's why I had hoped that it was a culture-specific Anglo-Saxon emotion. So I could sort of throw that to the anthropologists so they would feel I wasn't such an evil person. Uh, but uh, where the others appear, uh, I don't think we know. And nobody's working on it that I know of. Now you had a second question that was worse. <laughs> what was your second question? It was uh, the, the issue of voice stress test. Oh, yes. Uh, the voice stress, the voice has enormous information that could be relevant, that should be relevant to evaluating deception, but no one has done the work to mine that. Um, I know the people who were going to. Uh, I know the people who are trying now once again, but I do know that the voice stress test doesn't work. And uh, if you think it works, and you can convince your suspect that it works, that might be helpful to you. But that's not in the realm of science. Well, let's do one, one more question. So why? Why is the face such a giveaway? Well, I, I know it's, it's subtler than that, but Well, scientists don't usually answer why questions. We're, we're after how, when, where. But I, of course, can give you my answer to that one question, which is, you know, the face is an enormously complex system. It's the identity marker in human beings. It's an age marker. It's a race marker. Uh, it's where most of the sensory inputs are. It's where we get food and where we expel food that isn't getting along with us immediately. Uh, and we're social animals. And we don't survive except in collaborative activity, uh, by and large. Uh, I had the chance to live in a Stone Age culture in 1967, uh, where literally the only stone implements were being used. And I had a chance to see what life was like with people who had very little clothes and never left their village in a lifetime. And there was almost nothing other than the so-called little house that was done alone. Everything was done in social groups, in cooperative social groups. And the face is, uh, does a very good job in letting you know where things are going. The, and it's a long distance system. I did a study published uh, 30 years ago, at what distance can you recognize 
the emotions one from another. And it turns out to be the distance between the middle of the stage and the back of the Globe Theater. So they must have tested out, since there were no binoculars, and built their theater so you'd be able to see the actors' faces. So it's not just an intimacy system. You know? I can tell how that guy in, all the way in the back row who's now looking away to see if there's <laughs> I can tell him something about how he's feeling uh, pretty well. And this is quite a distance. So it's a long distance, not just a short distance system. Thank you again.